joining us. Uh, my name is Nathan Frazee. I'm the project manager from the Boston Parks and Recreation Department, overseeing the improvements to Paula Titus Park. Next. So I just want to let everybody know that tonight's meeting is being recorded. It'll be available on the project website within a week. Uh, please be sure to share that with any neighbors who unfortunately couldn't attend tonight. I also want to note uh, during the portion, we ask you to keep your video and mics off. However, during the discussion that will follow uh, uh, in an effort to make this a little bit more personable, uh, we ask that everybody turn your video on if you're comfortable doing so. If not, totally keep it off. That's fine. Next. So with that being said, we want to ensure that this conversation is a pleasant experience for all and that the community members are com comfortable sharing their comments, questions, and feedback. So please be respectful and mindful of each other's time. We ask that uh, we only have an hour and a half together tonight. So let's keep the questions and comments uh, project specific and on point. Please be sure to wait uh, until all attendees have had an, the opportunity to ask a question or provide a comment before asking a second one. Uh, I'm also providing my contact information on there. So if you desire to uh, do additional conversation offline, uh, you can reach me there. My contact will also is also later in the pr presentation. Next. So I wanna go over just a couple of quick uh, Zoom tips. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be asking participants that are comfortable to turn their cameras on during the discussion portion. Uh, during that time, you can raise your hand and unmute uh, once you are called upon. Uh, you can do that by uh, the little blue uh, icon uh, that has a raise hand. It has a little blue high five symbol. Uh, there's also some additional other prompts and you can click that yes, no, fast, slow, pause, uh, things like that. Um, I don't think anybody's calling in, so we don't really need to go through the phone uh, approach. Also, if you do have a question during the presentation, you can use uh, the chat feature. So there's a little uh, button at the bottom that says chat. So you can add your comments there, uh, or comments or questions. We'll do our best to answer those mostly verbally, just so everybody can, can hear uh, and, and they don't have to worry about following along in the chat feature. Um, so next. So, uh, and we're gonna go, I'm gonna go over some of the project overview, next. So um, tonight's agenda includes uh, introduction to the project team, uh, project overview, We'll have a presentation with uh, context images as well as precedent images of examples. Then we'll have a listening and discussion portion and we'll close the meeting with some last minute remarks in what the next steps are. Next. So as I said, my name is Nathan Frazee. I'm the project manager from the Parks Department uh, overseeing Paula Titus Park. Uh, also from the Parks Department is Christine Brandeo, our outreach coordinator. She's an excellent contact for any current issues or friends group development. Uh, our design team for this project is CBA Landscape Architects. From their office, we have Kayla Bachman and Jocelyn Wolf. I also included uh, Office of Neighborhood Services contact here. So if there are any issues happening in the neighborhood that may be not specific to this park, but uh, that you wanna convey, that's, that's a great contact to, to get some of those issues addressed. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie Titus who, uh, who's with us tonight. So he can speak for a minute to Paula's legacy and what this park means, uh, not only to the family, but the community and the city as a whole. Charlie. Thank you, Nate. Um, good evening and happy new year to everybody. Thank you for joining us. I wanna take a little time to thank Nate and Kayla and Jocelyn for uh, the work that they've done so far and the work that they're going to do uh, to make Paula Titus Park a reality. Um, also want to thank uh, Mayor Walsh and the Boston Park Department, specifically the Park Commission uh, for voting, uh, supporting and voting to name uh, the park, the Paula Titus Park. Paula lived in this neighborhood right across the street, 79 Fort Ave for over 40 years. Um, she enjoyed sitting on the deck. She enjoyed watching people and meeting her neighbors from her deck. She enjoyed watching the activity in that park for those 40 years. You know, initially back in the early, mid to late seventies, the park was used or the land was used as a volleyball court. 
and so on. Sundays and Saturday mornings, the, the neighbors from all around this neighborhood, Beach Glen and Highland Park Ave and <clears throat> Highland Street, Fort Ave, would come and have volleyball games and, and uh, sort of share, meet each other, greet each other, and be neighborly. Um, I will say that uh, over the last several years, the Condominium Association, which is right behind the piece of land, has done a really, really good job of taking care of the land and having it used uh, by the community for community events and parties and those kinds of things. So we're certainly grateful to them for the plantings they put in there and for, for the cutting the grass and maintaining the land all those years. You know, for, for my family, and I'm sure Paul would want this, um, it's a small park. It's going to be a small park and mostly passive for, for relaxing, um, getting to meet neighbors. Um, hopefully it will be something that promotes safety and health. It will be a place where connections can be made. Um, it should be accessible. There should be full neighborhoods of use of that, that park and the facility. And its focus should be adult and children. So it's it's not, I mean, we have a lot of young children in this which we did 10 years ago. And certainly a lot of uh, young adults. It's a diverse neighborhood, very diverse in terms of uh, ethnicity, age, um, and even income. So it, it can be and it should be a place for everybody in the neighborhood to come together and develop relationships that will be hopefully um, long lasting. So with that, thank you very much and I'll give it back to you. Great, thank you, Charlie, uh, for those great words and in, in background on the park as well. So, next slide. So as Charlie mentioned, this is a, a brand new park for the parks department, even though it it's, has been a parcel used as a park by the community. Uh, the current funding uh, was from the Community Preservation Act for $35,000. That money is being used to kickstart the design process, um, which officially kicks off tonight with our, with our community meeting. Um, so we anticipate the, the, uh, having two additional meetings that go into late spring. Um, uh, Kayla and her team at CBA are going to work to create uh, construction documents and a much more precise drawing that we can then use for uh, any funding requests or, or uh, budgetary requests. Uh, we are uh, looking to both grants and capital funding requests to fund the construction of the park. But because we do not have cap, um, construction money currently secured, I have a to be decided or determined for the anticipated construction and, and park opening. Next. So Charlie uh, started uh, and gave a little bit of some of these park uh, notes, but just talking about what goes into uh, park design. Um, there's uh, currently four elements that we try and weigh. Uh, we, one is the city of Boston priorities, uh, parks and recreation goals, community input, which we're getting tonight with, uh, with all of you attending, um, but also any safety guidelines or regulatory guidelines that we have to uh, oversee on the design. Next. Uh, so during the project planning as a city, we prioritize expanding park uh, access, which again, creating a brand new park uh, within our park system. This is certainly addressing that. Also addressing equality, uh, climate resiliency, promoting public health and building strong communities. Next. Uh, the park department, uh, Parks Department also has uh, some park specific goals which overlap with the city priorities. These include uh, creation of parks uh, that are accessible and available to all, provide a diverse and balanced programming, uh, promote meaningful and inclusive community engagement, create adaptive and resilient landscapes and promote connections. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Kayla to go over the context uh, of the site as well as precedent images. Kayla? Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying that 
Uh, we at CBA are very excited to be a part of this project. Um, we don't often get to work on, on new parks. Um, and so we're really looking forward to working with Paula's family and the community to really um, design a park that's, and, and one day build the park um, that really represents um, sort of that spirit of community activism and, and engagement and uh, unity like Charlie was talking about. Um, so we really see this as, right now the program is fairly open-ended, so we really wanna hear from all of you um, through the discussion. Feel free to ask questions at any time in the chat, um, and I'll do my best to answer as I'm speaking, but um, it, we see this as a listening session. So we'll go through some slides about the site analysis and sort of some opportunities, some constraints that we see, um, but really we wanna hear the kind of things that, that you'd like to see at your part. Um, so I'll start off a little bit with context. So we can kind of, this is the park site right here. So it's, it's, it is small relative to the other parcels and green spaces in the area. Um, whoops, that was an accident. Um, so we have, you know, obviously the, uh, the Highland Park and Fort Hill Tower kind of up here. You have the community garden across the street um, and sort of a to do a brief overview of the different types of parks or types of open green spaces that are in the area. Um, these orange dots represent community gardens. So there are a lot of them that are nearby and those are, you know, similar to the, um, the Margaret Wright Memorial Garden across the street. Um, we also have quite a few passive parks in the area. So, um, you know, we have the Highland Park here, we have this is the um, um, like <laughs> St. Monica's Park. Um, and then, you know, anything that has this little bench symbol, sort of a passive park with that can have walking paths or um, spaces to sit, but they don't necessarily, they may or may not have um, be combined with other uses like a children's playground or any sort of sports fields, things like that. Um, there are quite a few playgrounds as well in the area. You have Marcella Playground over here. You have um, the Southwest Quarter. I mean, it's more of a linear park, but then you have Jackson Square Park um, kind of here at this little node. Um, there's McLaughlin Playground, which um, they actually designed a part of, although not the more active parts, the more passive walking trail part um, a few years ago. And then uh, there's Lambert Avenue Playground, which we also worked on pr fairly recently at renovation last, well, they sort of just wrapped up in this, this fall. Um, you also have Malcolm X Playground or Park down here. And let's see, we've got Mozart Street, Mission Hill, a few sort of smaller scattered playgrounds. And these uh, radii here represent, you know, this is a quarter mile, so depending on the topography and the roads that are available to you it would take five to 10 minutes to walk there from the park. And then this is 10 to 15 minutes for half a mile. It might be up to 20 minutes, depending on how direct of a route you can take to those other spaces. Um, then the more immediate surroundings, you really see that context with the, um, the, the Needham commuter rail and the orange line right here in that Southwest Corridor Park, Jackson Square Park right here. Um, and it, I mean, you can't tell in a bird's eye view, but it is on, up a, going up a pretty steep hill up Fort Ave. So um, the sidewalks in the street are on a slope, which is something that will, will be a design challenge for us um, as far as accessibility goes. But um, I think we can make something work here that'll at the very least one entrance will be able to be accessible. Uh, we also have um, the, this um, Emmanuel College campus that's right here and the adjacent park space. Um, and you see the, the park is really, it can be accessed really only from Ford Avenue, but you can see where there would be a lot of kind of circulation patterns either coming in from this side or coming, coming from downhill or coming from uphill. So, sort of an opportunity there to 
um, maybe have entrances on both sides. And then you, this is the current entrance here, the little red arrow and the orange arrow shows an entrance that comes from uh, the open green space that's managed by the condominium association that expands beyond, sort of beyond or behind the park. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that once we get into photos of the views um, through those spaces. So here we zoom in even further. We have our community garden. Um, this is the Beach Glen Condominium Complex Association here. Um, there are also private residences on this side. So uh, you're going north is sort of over in this direction towards the top left corner of the page. Um, but you're going up, you know, you come from the right and you go to the left, you're going downhill. Um, so you see these faint gray lines, those are from MassGIS and they represent the topography of the site. So each one is one foot in change of elevation. Um, and then here's that open space that I was talking about that's privately owned by Beach Glen, but they, there's a the little gate here that um, opens up to the lawn space. Um, and they have a few features there and they, they have maintained this space for um, in the recent past. So here we go, there's that beach building condos. So looking towards the Southeast, you see houses and we might think about, you know, whether these neighbors would like to look into the park, whether they prefer for it to be screened. We'd love to hear those kind of opinions. Um, the same thing on the other side is there, you know, do we screen this? Do we leave it open? And kind of, there's, there's sort of arguments for and against um, having a buffer with neighbors and a lot of it can be really up to preference. Um, more open sight lines can create sort of an expansiveness and let people look into the park, which can deter sort of undesirable activity if that's something that happens. Um, but a lot of times residents that are so close to public spaces prefer to have a little more buffer space there. So we can, that's certainly a conversation that we can have as part of this meeting. Um, look at the Western corner, you kind of get this like little slot view looking out, which would be nice to frame um, somehow. But then you also get this open, or sorry, this borrowed view of, of larger vegetation that's not in the park property, but it's beyond um, in the condos, in the Beach Glen um, property and sort of on the border. And this is I think a steep hill kind of going down that buffers into the neighboring properties down here. Um, you can see a little bit of what the um, the amenities they have here in the private space. So there's kind of a deck platform with um, I think some some furniture and maybe some grills and then there's some furniture out in the lawn. And then some of that has sort of migrated out you know, people keep a few plastic chairs sort of out in Paul Titus Park. Um, and there's, you know, someone's planted this little tree here, which I'll talk more about the vegetation, um, which I guess is, is a question of whether that was planted, um, you know, for a specific, as a memorial tree or a specific purpose, or it's just to kind of help enliven the space a little bit more. Um, Right now, the park, the park is completely fenced. So there's a four foot chain link fence kind of around most of it. There's an opening here at the street and an opening between that privately owned space and the park. Um, and then there's a taller fence. I'm not sure if it's six or eight feet tall, but it's sort of at the toe of this slope coming down um, towards the edge of the property. This entrance is uh, not ADA compliant um, if only, it, I'm not sure exactly what the cross slope does on the sidewalk and we're waiting on the exact measurements of the survey there, um, but we, it, it, lawn is not considered an accessible surface. So if you're walking into lawn, that's, that's not considered ADA compliant. Um, so creating a paved entrance with some sort of paving is a, definitely a priority and to create some kind of circulation pattern through the site that's going to um, encourage people to come in and be able to move around the site without you know making wear patterns and things like that. All 
All right, here's a little bit more detail on that slope analysis. You really have this high point in the middle of the site and it slopes down towards the street. You see kind of where these contour lines get closer together that indicates that it's steeper. Um, so this corner is pretty steep and we've kind of got this shading to show where the steeper areas are and where the less, you know, the flatter areas are. So here's your minimal slope with zero to 5%. You've got a little bit more sort of pushing out and then in the corners here it really dives off. So if there was another entrance here, we'd want to talk about um, whether we would need steps there, we might need some kind of walls to help retain the earth um, and make sure that the circulation works essentially. Oh, and yeah, we have our blue arrows here showing water movement. So water flows downhill, that's, that's the basic premise. Um, and sort of managing storm water is always an important part of our park design um, to design the site in a way that you don't have puddles, you don't have areas that don't drain well, um, you don't want water to collect and make, you know, like shallow areas where you have mosquitoes breeding, things like that. Um, and it can also, that sort of water accumulation and water flow can cause erosion of the soil. So then you have sort of a messy uncovered patch that's washing dirt and everything into the storm drain system, um, which is uh, something you avoid on, on all projects, but especially public, we don't want public parks to ever be sort of burdening the public systems that way. Then as far as vegetation goes, there are a few ornamental, um, I think they're cherry trees, sort of spaced along the fence here. And they do, I think they add a lot to the site because they are pretty large. They're um, the largest trees on the site, perhaps with the exception of there's what we think is an elm tree in the corner as you enter, which is quite nice and, and elms are, are fairly rare. Um, but the cherry trees, I'm sure, add some very nice spring color. Um, should I? I'm just wondering if I should admit this person from the waiting room. Is that I have a little notification there? Oh, I, th I think Christine can hit it. Thanks. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, we have. Oh yeah. So there's also this little weeping cherry here. That's that's down adjacent to the private land um, and kind of assorted like lilac bushes and some shrubs. Um, the condo association also has this yew hedge outside the site that sort of prevents, kind of covers that chain link fence as you look into the park, which is, which is quite nice. And then behind it, you see that there's this big evergreen tree on the private property too. Um, it's a big blue spruce, it looks like. So yeah, a lot, and then you have, I know that this like sloped area was cleared over the summer of a lot of kind of weedy vegetation and overgrowth. So, okay, um, here's a quick little diagram of kind of sun uh, patterns throughout the year. So the closer we have, you know, our sun rising in the east, setting in the west, and the closer you're, you are, these little arrows are to the middle here, that would be, the middle would be directly overhead. So we're sort of representing the angle of the sun, which changes throughout the year. Um, in the spring, you have sort of the medium angle and the sun is rising almost in due east and setting due west. Um, in the summertime, when the days are longer, you have it rising in the northeast and setting in the northwest. And you really have a longer arc where the sun follows more directly overhead, so you have a higher sun angle. Um, in the fall, again, it sort of oops, goes back to this um, kind of middle pattern, like the spring. Um, you know, you're again due east, due west, and you're sort of medium angle of the sun, the medium length days. And then in the winter, you have the sun rising uh, more in the southeast, and you have this very low sun angle and less, you know, much shorter days. Oops, all right, I think that was the last one. Okay, so we'll go through some precedent images. Um, these are, let's make sure there are no questions. No, nope, nothing yet. Um, these are 
uh, precedent images, they're, they're really just, we wanna show a lot of ideas. So it's a jumping off point for you to give your feedback. Um, and there are a lot of elements in all of these images. Some, some of them kind of overlap. We have them separated by categories, but you know, there's not often a bench like without paving. So some of the things are, are overlapping, but uh, feel free to comment on any of the elements you see in the images that you might like um, or, or dislike for that matter. Um, starting off pretty generally with some passive park images. So when we talk about passive parks, they're usually uh, spaces where there's uh, not necessarily active recreation. So it's, you know, there might be some benches, some walkways, some nice plantings. Um, and a note about the Boston Parks Department and um, their maintenance of plantings. Um, typically, Boston Parks prefers to have uh, kind of trees and lawn as, as the very maintainable base level of plantings. Um, but if there is interest in the community in starting a friends group that would be interested in maintaining more elaborate plantings, like maybe some shrubs or perennials, um, if there are some gardeners maybe that, that use the space across the street that would want to come an hour or two a week and sort of help maintain that, um, it could be a possibility to include those elements. And Nate, is there anything else that you would want to add about kind of having more um, intensive plantings, I guess, as in the friend and a friends group? Yeah, I, just a, again, a friends group, one, uh, the level of intimacy that friends groups bring to knowledge of the plants in the park and, and mm -hmm. um, desire to maintain at a high level. So as Kayla said, we, we generally keep more of a lawn and a tree and maybe shrub, um, type plantings, but anything more elaborate would, would be in conjunction with a friends group. Um, we could talk about including some sculptural features. Maybe it's um, sort of a decorative entrance like this one. This is um, in the South End at Monsignor Reynolds Playground. Um, you know, these are sculptural kind of um, they're, they move in the wind, so these are like little spoons and they catch the wind and they spin. Um, this is at a park in Chelsea. Um, and this was an image we found online that it's sort of this cut out steel that is, is illustrative and they have it lit at night, but I think that would be maybe a lot for this park. But, you know, they're, this sort of method of creating shapes with uh, water jet cutting can be used for smaller elements than this. So this is a large example, but you can create a decorative feature, a personalized, customized feature. Um, there's also a photo later on that shows some steps that could uh, kind of serve as a model for um, that entrance that's on the downhill side. So I'll, I'll point that out when we get to that as well. I don't want to go too quickly because I want to let people absorb the images. It's hard to know because I've seen them a dozen times. Um, so there is potential for some memorial elements or features. Um, if that's something that the community feels is appropriate, um, it could be a sort of garden space. Um, this is a memorial where they kind of have this sculptural fence, um, you know, weaving through, or maybe it's kind of decorative paver, paving elements that could be incorporated into a plaza space or um, something like that. And here it's something similar. So, you know, you could have some seat walls with some nice benches. Maybe there's, um, for this, we, this was a CBA concept for um, a, a memorial garden in uh, Medway that, you know, Medway is a very different community, but, um, I think some of the elements of, you know, this was, it talked about, uh, or, or the concept was to kind of have bits of poetry kind of engraved on stones that were set throughout the space. So I thought that would be a nice idea to show. Um, there may be the possibility of incorporating a shade structure of some kind. So, you know, you have your more traditional structure like a gazebo that's very central. You know, a lot of times people think of these almost as like a bandstand element. If there's, um, if there are any kind of 
performances that happen in this space already, maybe they need a home. Um, or you can have something that's just really more of a shade structure, um, it, such as this pergola here, this is wooded metal. There's more kind of contemporary ones that are, that are all metal that are prefabricated. Um, and you can have, this one was, this is a project that we took the picture before the furniture was put in underneath, but um, we would have anchored furniture underneath. So it could be picnic tables. It might be tables and chairs. Um, Sometimes we include game tables that have sort of two chairs and then a chess board that people can bring their own pieces to play on. Uh, there are, oh, here's one of the photos of that, that, those stair, that stair entrance that I was mentioning, but there's another one later. Um, this shows some seating elements. So you can have these seat walls, um, Obviously, more formal furniture, such as small tables and chairs. Um, maybe it's this more sculptural picnic table. And this is uh, use this on another project with Nate, but I don't have any pictures of that one, so we use this one instead. Um, you know, you have some sort of pet benches in the background here, uh, or you can have seat walls that they're a sculptural feature, but they're also useful, and you can. Um, we didn't have a picture here, but you can put, you can mount like sort of metal um, benches to the top so they're a little more comfortable as well. So here you kind of see a little bit of that. So here we did wood. This is on a concrete bench. Um, and th these are the stairs I was talking about. So this slide shows some paving options. So you can have it was sort of sleek contemporary look with linear pavers. Um, these are concrete. You can go with something a little more traditional. So we don't normally do brick as a base paving in, in public spaces um, because it's, it's, it can be a maintenance issue um, and it's, well, it's expensive, but we find that you can get a really nice feel if you can combine sort of concrete paving and have a banding pattern with brick. Um, and then here, this was more for sort of the, the feel of the paving, because this is decking, which isn't really appropriate for the site, but you know, maybe there's sort of a swooping path that moves through the site and, and weaves through some trees, like a little grove, that kind of thing. Um, and then Open lawn and flexible space is really something that this, this park lends itself well to based on Charlie's description of the things that have happened there in the past. So, you know, the possibilities are kind of endless. You can play ball, you can play you know, volleyball, like Charlie said, you can play soccer, um, you can have a picnic, you can have events where, you know, people set up tables or and grills and all that kind of thing. So, um, each of these has sort of a different feel. You kind of have this um, lawn with, with trees so that you have some shade. Um, this is pretty open. This is a lawn um, for a, in a park that we did in Everett. And really all the more intensely used features like play equipment and there's a basketball court, they're all around the edge of the park and the lawn is sort of towards the back. So you can, and it's up a little bit higher so you can really kind of see what's down below. Um, and this is a little courtyard sort of it's not really a courtyard. It's a small pocket park um, at the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. So this is almost more of a plaza kind of public square feel. We can include um, wayfinding or interpretive signage. So some of these pictures are from a McLaughlin playground, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, here, you know, this is how you would navigate the park itself, because it's quite large, it has three terraces. So they each each of the terraces has a different um, purpose or feature. Uh, in one of the terraces, there's a historic apple orchard that's maintained by, I think it's an urban wilds group, or um, it's uh, I'm blanking on the name, but it's it has some historic apple varieties, and then um, people have added some more. So uh, we designed an Kind of interpretive sign here that's a guide to the apples that grow there. I think it is an urban wild because I think the, the trees you're allowed to just go and pick the fruit so 
that's open to the public. Um, and then we have sort of more regular, you know, park signage, such as this granite plaque for Ross Playground. And for Paul at Titus Park, particularly, I thought it, it might be interesting to kind of give people some clues of, because there's so many things that are happening in the neighborhood. Would you have, you know, some markers that would point in different directions and say, you know, to Southwoods Corridor Park or to the Fort Hill Tower, you know, all that, all those different elements that would be attractions to people visiting. Although most people here will know it because it is going to be a neighborhood park. Um, and then there is an opportunity to have sort of some play elements in the space. And playgrounds take up a lot of space. So a large playground is probably not quite what we would be specifying here. It would be something that would be incorporated into a kind of a larger passive park context. Um, but we have a few photos of, um, these are, this is mostly equipment for younger children. So ages two to five. So, you know, you could include kind of a little spinner thing or these small play structures. Um, here, this is a climbing structure that's very sculptural. Um, this is for older kids though, probably five to 12. Although this we thought was a nice photo to show because of the context of having these passive park spaces around that seating area with the chairs and tables, um, this sort of open lawn space. There, you know, depending on feedback from the neighbors, you may be able to, or people might want to see some outdoor musical instruments. Um, there are some that are not very loud um, and the, the park, you know, depending on where they're situated, they can, they can make sense or not. And then this sort of back in the corner here, there's a dish swing, which is, you know, or a basket swing, we call them sometimes that um, it, it takes up less space, space than traditional swing. And it can be a really collaborative form of play because multiple children can use them at the same time or a parent with a baby or that kind of thing. A very versatile um, piece of equipment that can be better for a small space. And then um, this is an example, this bottom picture of uh, sort of a, a walking loop and trails, or not really trails, but walking paths that, you know, we kind of have some sculptural play elements uh, dotted in to this larger passive part. So there's a shade structure back here. Um, there's just a few pieces and then kind of these, these climbing pieces here, but um, you can have elements that are playable without it taking up the entire space. Um, and here are a couple more examples of that, that, you know, that sculptural play, you know, maybe it's something linear where it's uh, something children can balance on or um, make their own, invent their own games, things like that. Um, down here, we have a couple of examples of more natural play spaces. So you've got kind of big boulders, a big boulder field. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the play equipment. So you would need to have a safety surfacing underneath. Um, and so some of these are very brightly colored, but it, they come in all different colors. So uh, you can choose, you know, we can have a conversation about whether we would choose something that's more natural looking, whether the bright color is something that people want to see. Um, there's all kinds of, you get to pick whatever combination you want, basically. So there's a lot of choices there. Um, and back to these natural place spaces, you know, is it, um, you know, we have here kind of these balancing stumps and boulders um, and logs. So there are, there's, uh, there's, there are commercial equipment of these, this is just natural materials, but for Boston Parks, we'd probably use um, commercial pieces that would comply with all the, this is at a private, this is at a Mass Audubon sanctuary, so they don't need to comply with uh, safety regulations in quite the same way because it's not a public space. Um, but there are elements that can look like this that are that are uh, sort of vetted by the um, playground safety standards and everything like that. Oops. Okay, and so I'll turn it over to Nate again, and we kind of have a conversation discussion about these. And I'm happy to, I know we're going to go to the, we're, well, not I know, we're going to switch to um, the form. I'm going to close the presentation and we'll switch to 
a face-to-face -face format so people can see their cameras and we can chat um, that way, but I'm happy to open it back up if people want to look back at any of the photos too. Great. So we'll turn it over to Nate. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, so I just want to uh, bring this slide back up again with the Zoom tips. Um, again, we're gonna ask you that if you're comfortable to turn your uh, cameras on, uh, if you can use the raise hand feature, that way we will know to call on you uh, for a question. Um, when you're called upon, you can unmute yourself and then ask the question. Uh, and then if you don't mind, once, once uh, the discussion of the question is, is completed, just uh, re-mute yourself. Um, again, you can also in the chat feature, type your question and send it there if you don't feel comfortable speaking. Uh, so at this point, I'm gonna have Kayla um, stop the presentation and then it's gonna come up with all of our names. Uh, Christine's gonna let uh, everybody uh, activate their camera now. So in the lower right-hand corner, if you wanna turn your cameras on, uh, feel free to do so. I already, Brandy, great, wonderful, thank you. Jose, perfect. Debbie, great. Um, so uh, with that being said, um, if Brandy's anybody- the first one. <laughs> I see Brandy's uh, hand, perfect. So Brandy, uh, we're gonna let you unmute yourself and then you can feel free to ask your question. Okay, so I have or a comment. Comment, comment then a question. So I live directly across the street from the park, like I'm at 55 Fort Avenue. So my question <clears throat> is, when is going to be the final decision about what structures happen? And, and so that's the first question. Then the second question is, when you thought about the, Paul, the Paula Park, Paula Titus Park, did you also consider the other structures in the other park, like at, you know, the fort, uh, Marcella, and, you know, just in terms of thinking about what would make sense in that particular space? So that's, that's kind of my, my two questions. And then I have a third one, but I, I wanna get a response to those two first. Sure, well, I'll, I'll talk about the, when the decision process happens. Um, so we're anticipating two additional meetings after this one. Um, Kayla and, and her team is going to collect the input from this meeting. They're gonna then put together some concepts and come back and present. We'll get your, uh, the community's feedback to make sure, uh, one, what we're presenting and proposing is something that you all want. Um, but during that meeting, um, usually we try and make them like three distinct designs and they'll have different elements. And then we'll listen to the community, see what you like from each of them. And we'll come back for the third meeting, hopefully with all of that comprised into one design that, that everybody is in support of. Um, so that's, that's the process we anticipate this playing out uh, over the next uh, couple months to get, to get a finalized design. So with that on the design process, I'll turn it over to Kayla so she can speak to what they uh, looked at in the neighborhood. Yeah, so as far as the actual structures at other parks, I mean, we see this more of as kind of a brainstorming session. So the photos that we show are really ideas. Um, if there are specific things about um, the other parks in the neighborhood that you really like and would like to see more of nearby, then that would be really helpful information or anything that you do not like that you would, you know, that you're like, oh, we have that over there. We really don't need it in this park. Um, and I know that I'm not sure when you talk about structures, are you talking about, I'm not sure if you're talking about place structures or like shade structures or um, kind of how specific that is. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, I mean, I was talking about to in total, like, mm -hmm. you know, when you were mentioning pavers, when you were mentioning benches, when you were mentioning, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, some of the playground structures and things like mm -hmm. that. I mean, the space itself is just not that big. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's just, it's really not. So yeah. when you were talking about pavers and stuff, I was like, mm, okay, I don't know where that's going to fit, um, yeah. you know. I, well, we can't but, have it all. <laughs> we can have some of these things. So it's, you know, which of these things would be a priority is sort of the, the goal of showing all those. But no, you're absolutely right. We couldn't have um, every single one of those elements. It would be really be cramming a lot into. Yes. Um, yeah. But I, I want to, I'll just step back and let somebody else kind of speak and take the mic. But I, I really, for these 
next few meetings, um, I think it's important to have more community voice on the line, like, you know, um, those who live in the community and actually use the park. I mean, right now it's literally just used for dog, you know, it's a dog park right now. Um, people just take their dogs because they don't want to walk up the street. Um, so that's what its main purpose is right now. I mean, it used to be kind of a community theater. Um, the neighbors would rent a screen and, you know, have movies and stuff out there, but, uh, you know, COVID. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to see kind of the plans, but I definitely want to see more community members on future calls, kind of adding input. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so one of the, and to get that input, again, this is going to be recorded. So be sure to share this out with them. Um, and then hopefully we can get them to join in future meetings as well. And, and something that we may be able to do if we have um, enough people too, is to kind of do breakout rooms in Zoom and, and have kind of a more intimate conversation than like raising your hand, <laughs> you know, to ask a question. So maybe uh, the next one, if there's, you know, more people we can we can sort of break into groups and facilitate those conversations and then kind of circle back. Great. Michelle, Any other questions? Michelle has her hand up. Oh, perfect. Hello. Um, I live on um, in the condos <laughs> that abut the park. Um, so 78 Ford Ave. And I just had a question. Um, you know, there are some questions about, you know, would we want a wall, would we want one wall, you know, stuff like that. Um, we'd like to collaborate. Is there an opportunity to submit comments offline so Kayla, you can have a list of things to address while you're doing the development? And we yeah, can get absolutely. To so all of those, I would say if you're gonna sort of collect um, written comments, maybe from your neighbors or you know, sort of submit them as you know from the condo association, I think sending them to Nate would be the best. He's the He's the conduit for all the feedback. So the name? Um, okay. Yeah, yep. yeah. And his we'll put his email address back up. Yeah. Um, at the uh, end so that everybody has it, as exactly. well as the project website, which I think also mm -hmm. will have it. Right. I'm gonna drop it in the chat for everyone now too. Oh, okay. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks, Christine. Do you have Michelle, did you have any input uh, just on what was presented from your perspective? Obviously, definitely take it back to the rest oh, yeah. of the units, but I'm just curious what your thoughts were. No, there's just a, a lot of different ideas, things that I haven't even thought of before. I've never <laughs> been involved in planning a park, so I'm looking forward to the ideas and- um... Does he have any input? I saw I saw <laughs> a wave there, so. Uh, I do. I wanted to say thank you to Charles um, and, uh, you know, great neighborhood, mm -hmm. great neighbor. And uh, I like the fact that it's a dog park now, but I understand. <laughs> I'm but I love seeing the dogs. So thank you. All right, good input. <laughs> there were just so many ideas that uh, I'm excited. To... And are these slides available online, offline? Yeah. So the the recording of tonight will be posted a <clears throat> uh, a uh, recording of the meeting minutes. So uh, CBA's team is going to actually write type up uh, meeting minutes as well. Um, but then the presentation will also be posted. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna put up the project website, but I can tell you from navigating the Parks Department webpage, the easiest way to find it is just Google search Polititis, uh, improvements to Polititis, and it will, it, it's like the number one thing that shows up in Google, so. I also, um, we made a, and, QR, a short URL for it. Yeah, so and Christine it. already posted it too, so mm -hmm. she's on top of it tonight. She, she keeps me in line, so. Um, so again, those, uh, in, if you go to that project page at the bottom of it is uh, past presentations and that's where all of this information will be placed. Thank right. you, Charles is next. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a question, but I do have a couple of comments. Um, one, uh, and this is for uh, uh, Kayla and Joyce and one, I, I think the buffer, buffering the properties will probably be an important aspect of it. Um, we didn't talk a lot about lighting, but I think that uh, because the condo, so the two, it's, it's two condo associations, one on either side. Oh, okay. um, so we don't, I don't think that it, it makes sense to put a lot of heavy lighting out there. Mm -hmm. Maybe just some light lighting that uh, will, will be on an automatic timer and go off at a certain time. Um, furniture. I like the idea of putting a, uh, a game table 
I've seen the concrete game tables with the checkerboard pieces in it and people bring their own checkers and chess sets and that kind of thing. I think that would go well there. Um, fencing would be an important element, I think. I'm not crazy about the chain link fence. And if we could do something a little more ornate, it would sort of uh, bring a little more character to the neighborhood. Um, yeah, we could certainly bring some options um, to yeah. the next meeting of how to fence the space that's an upgrade from chain link for sure. Good. I think uh, when you talk about memorial features, I, I don't know if that part's big enough, but I think I like that little granite stone uh, block that you had in one of the parts that could probably be a, uh, have a little bit about who was Paul Titus. I mean, people might say, who's Polititis? Why is the name Polititis? So if we could do something like that to put a little piece out there about Paula and why the park was named after her. Um, and the final comment at this point would be, um, if we could make sure that we put features in there that accommodate uh, social activities. Like mm -hmm. we had uh, um, one of the young ladies who, who, when she graduated from high school, then we put in some tents and uh, we had a nice little neighborhood party out there for it. It was really nice. A lot of people came. So if we could accommodate tents and, and grills and those kinds of things, not permanent grills, but people could bring their grill and have somewhere to set it up uh, <clears throat> so that it made sense logistically, um, I think that would be a good thing. And, and seating areas where people can just sit and really enjoy the day. And I think what I'm something I'm really drawing out of, out of your comments and ideas, Charlie, too, is that um, the space should remain flexible, too, to be able to use for different purposes and not, you know, be overdeveloped and have, have too much going on. And I think that kind of was one of Brandy's concerns and her questions, too, was, um, you know, is this going to be too full of stuff for it to really serve some of the prep purposes that it's already serving for the for the neighborhood? Yes. Nate, could you talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the ordin ordinances that would probably apply here? I know that there are a number of people who um, like the idea of having a dog park there, but I know that there are some um, rules and policies that govern dog parks that, that says that you probably just can't do one there. Yeah, um, looking at the, just the square footage that we do for typical dog parks, um, I think 6,000 square feet is some of our smallest ones, which again would take up the vast majority of our site. So uh, realistically, if, this, if, if we were to incorporate dogs, it would, that would be like a sole, sole use purpose. It wouldn't be a passive park. It wouldn't have a playground. It wouldn't have any other elements other than a dog park, which I don't think was the intent uh, when this park was established and voted on by the, the Parks Commission. So uh, just with the square footage needs of that and the uh, uh, direct abutting uh, neighbors, it doesn't seem likely that that would be something we would pursue at this time. Uh, but to mention the lighting, um, I agree. I think, um, you know, we also don't want this to be, um, you know, lit up like a sports arena for late evenings. So, um, you know, a lot of times we, don't light parks and we have them, uh, we have our park rules and our stuff to dawn and we allow the sun to be the activator of opening and closing our parks. Um, with that being said, we do have uh, pedestrian lights in some of our passive parks. So it could have that very um, light uh, aspects of lighting in it. Um, so. And I did mean to um, say this in the context slide, but there is a, a formal dog park at um, Fitzgerald Park, which is within, I think, definitely less than half a mile, and it may be between half a mile and a quarter mile away. And that's a, and a much larger park, so. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of options for lighting. Do we have any other questions? Anyone else? Thank I you. have a question. Oh, perfect. Great. Go ahead, Debbie. <laughs> for, for comment. Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm Paula's sister. Um, I live in Western Mass, and I'm not as familiar with um, all the parks in the area. I am familiar with the space um, that we're talking about today. So um, I think it's a wonderful thing 
to do in honor of my sister. And thank you, Charlie. Um, it was very helpful to hear all this background because I wasn't familiar with any of it, but um, I think a lot of the ideas are, are just beautiful and wonderful. I hope I don't cry. <laughs> um, it's totally okay if you do. <laughs> But um, I do, I think I heard you say that there is a budget of $35,000. Is that correct? That, that's just for the design. That's just to kick us off for the design. So okay, because whatever the community comes up with will cost estimate and we'll uh, work hard to get funding for. Okay, that, that's, that was one concern because some of the um, structures look expensive and I didn't know if there was some budgetary um, criteria that should exclude some things that we might say, oh, we really like that. Um, and I love the sculptures. I love the idea of uh, sound sculptures. And um, there's just so much talent in the area. Is there a consideration to reach out to local artists or sculptors or um, creative people that would be willing to make a donation to showcase their talent, um, anything like that? Um, so the one, the one thing to consider with that is any art that goes into the public realm has to go through the arts commission. Um, that, uh, th th that way they, you know, as a landscape architect, I don't have the qualification to even evaluate public art. But, you know, I, I like it, I don't like it. That's kind of the gist of my knowledge on it. Um, so any piece uh, or, or desire for a sculpture goes through the arts commission. The time period of that, um, can be a bit longer than our process because they need to, you know, secure the site, uh, get a um, agreement with the parks department, then solicit for designers, fund that, and then get it actually implemented. That's to that's. I'm not saying it's not something that could be done. It just would have a, a secondary process to ours. So and Charlie, I think can weigh in. Yeah, Nate. Um, from my days on the park commission, one thing I would say, I think that's a great idea, Debbie, particularly if you're reaching out to local artists who might want to showcase the rock. That's probably something that could be done after the park's done. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? And that, that would not, so that I think getting into that now, as Nate said, would slow our process down. Mm -hmm. um, and I rather, oh, But rather, it can be something that, you know, we create a platform that, you know, in right. the future and we let that process mm -hmm. play out, right. um, get developed. Yep. And again, when the, when the Arts Commission puts out their request for artist proposal, they typically put in some sort of criteria, you know, it'll need to fit on a, a six foot radius concrete platform. So any of that is what we will have already implemented in the park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for, for being joining here. us. Today. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions? Second, okay. Jose, Zay? you can unmute yourself. Good evening. How is, how's everybody doing? Doing well. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is good. Hey, Charlie, nice to see you, my neighbor. <laughs> well, I just wanted to, um, this is a great, this is a great thing. You know, I live right across, I can see the park right now from here. And uh, this is great. I knew Paula and I know Charlie, great neighbors. This is a wonderful thing. I just want to get back a little bit to the dogs because uh, we have, most of our neighbors have dogs up in this park and they've been allowed to kind of claim that land. And they're very aggressive, but just to put a sign that says no dogs allowed uh, is not good enough. They're very aggressive people. And up on the hill, Highland Park, uh, they have signs everywhere that says uh, dogs need to be unleashed. Uh, they have very aggressive dogs up there and you can't tell them to put them on leash. They will not do it. So just to, just to kind of evolve from dog is not enough. I think that in conjunction with the design, the neighborhood outreach people, the community services people need to uh, make sure that at least for the beginning part, the first phase of the park's use, that they become very aggressive with enforcing the no dog policy and the leash your dogs up on the hill because it's not enough. I know, I mean, I've been in this business for a long, long time dealing with, uh, dealing with people who move in and now with the pandemic dogs, we're gonna have a lot more dogs. So I just think that's not enough. I think that, uh, in conjunction with this, we need to have a first phase, uh, letting people know where the dog parks are, uh, having people come around and act, actually engaging with them and telling them it's not a dog park because they're very aggressive and they can be, their dogs can be very aggressive. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you for that input. Okay. Um, I, I think some things to consider with that is obviously right now, it's, it's for the most part is just an open lawn space. So with that comes the natural desire of like, what's the big deal? My dog, it's open lawn. It's not anything right now. My dog can go there. Um, my hope is once we uh, implement and establish this as a passive park, it's occupied by passive users, potentially children on some sort of play equipment if that's desired. Um, but we can really kind of reset the behavior. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the hope and desire. But with that being said, if that does continue to be an issue, one of the things is we can reach out to animal control, um, especially highlighting, you know, the times that it happens. Um, and then they can have, uh, you know, try and work. They're, they obviously are very short staffed there as well. So if we can get to them like exact time periods or like days, then it's a bigger issue. They can try and do some sort of presence uh, to make that, that be heard. But that's a great feedback, thank you. So what, So um, I don't see any other hands raised right now. I think was, was there any other ones? No. Um, so, oh, there's some in the chat, is that? Um, I just saw somebody had to run. They're looking forward to this and excited. That's good. So uh, based on what Kayla's uh, team presented and obviously some of the input in, in understanding that this is a very small, tight site do you, and looking at the proximity to other playgrounds, is there a desire to have you know, a small structure or some sort of, even if it's not a formal play equipment, some sort of playable equipment. I know I have a four-year-old, so, um, and I, even though I know all of the psychology of play, I still, I mean, folders still scare me with her. Um, so I, full disclosure on that. Do you think from the community's perspective, is there, is there a desire for some sort of element there? Nate, I had hoped that we would get, um, more participation, particularly from the newer condos across the street where there are some some babies and small children. I put some flyers over there. So I know they know about it. Um, and I, I had hoped that they would come on and, and speak. I think that there are, is, it, this is the best that I know. There are, across the street, there are two babies and three, three younger kids, five, six, seven years old. I think, uh, I think, Brandy, don't you have some young children? You still on Brandy? Hold on, uh, no, I don't have any young kids, uh, but a lot of the a lot of the neighbors do. Yeah, a lot of the neighbors do. Well, yeah. someone right next door to you, then I think maybe. But yeah, I, I yeah, think that, I I would think that there is a need for at least a piece of play equipment, right? That could span them. Um, I would say ages three to to seven or something like that. Yeah, um, the industry we, standard does. It's already like industry standard breakouts yeah. of age. So two to five and then five to 12. So most likely what we would be looking at is that two, two to five, five age. Yeah. But the other thing that to consider is, I mean, I know, you know, I didn't think about playground development until I had a kid, right? And then we look at the process, the, you know, from in, uh, the design process we're in now to when it actually gets built is about a year or two, right? So even if, even if people aren't thinking about it right now, it could be something that they're interested in the future. Uh, yeah. So especially anybody with a baby right now, thinking about a, a, a play structure for two to five, that's that's going to be pretty critical going forward. Yeah, and Nate, oh. Go ahead, Michelle. Oh, I was going to share that you know, we're planning on starting family, but it, within this complex, Charlie, we do have young children um, from that two to five range. So I don't yeah. want to speak, to them, but I would think that that would be incredible to just go um out for 15 minutes and have something right there versus it's kind of a long walk uphill to the to the big park and there's nothing there for children so okay great that's great feedback so we'll uh kayla's team will look at how you know again how do we make that seamless into the park so then it's not either a playground or a passive park it's, mm -hmm. we're going to try and have it be as diverse as possible that'd be um, great so again uh my question uh, some of the questions i guess i'm going to Put out there what did you guys think about any of the seat walls do you like the more stone ornamental do you like the smooth concrete um obviously any seating we're going to do here is going to be somewhat of a combination 
we have to do some sort something to do with the elevation. So oftentimes seat walls works on as a retaining feature. So I'm just curious what the thoughts are on, on any of those elements. I see Which Charlie, one? Charlie going to unmute, but Brandy, um, did you unmute there? Yeah, okay, yeah go good ahead. question. Which one? Which one is more comfortable? Because while we have, while we definitely have the kind of growing family population, we also have a lot of older adults as mm -hmm. well um, that use the park up the street and would, you know, a year from two from now use that space across the street as well. So which one provides, I guess, the most comfort <laughs> for, you know, both of those populations? Well, I'm going to weigh in real or... quick, but I'm okay. going to then turn it over to Kayla. So one of the things is we we typically do have the age friendly uh, commission, or um, it's it's changed names so many times, elderly commission, and um, age they strong. age strong now. Sorry, <laughs> I'm friend. They're friendly too, so age friendly <laughs> works in my book. Um, we they have some parameters that they give us that we typically weigh in on that as well. But um, I'm going to let Kayla. Uh, so we, I, I, I want to reiterate, we keep that in mind with, with this process, but Kayla can speak to some of the examples she's, she showed you guys. Yeah, so the, um, a lot of times what we do, because the natural materials like concrete and granite and fieldstone are really not that comfortable to sit on by themselves for any length of time. I mean, you might sit and sort of like drink your coffee, but you're not going to sit for 45 minutes or an hour on, a, on something that's hard in stone. Um, but the um, you can get more comfortable like bench seats that are mounted to those surfaces so you can get something that's a little more ergonomic that would be similar to sitting um, like on a park bench or something um, you can get them with backs actually but usually if we're going to do that we do like a freestanding bench because um, the the like wall mounted benches are are a little bit they there's sort of advantages and disadvantages to having them. Um, but they're, I think having something comfortable for the majority of people most of the time is, is, a, is going to be a priority at this park because it is so small. We don't wanna have, you know, like a ton of seating all over the place that nobody really wants to use. Um, and so I hope that answers the question a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll, I'll just chime in too. So one of the things that we do here from uh, Age Strong is the, uh, especially for our older population, is seating options with backs, like Kayla mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, but also armrests, uh, both for getting into the seat and out of the seat. So we can certainly, um, um, you know, kind of weigh that in. It wouldn't be on every single seat, but we'll be sure that a, a certain amount of our seats do meet that that need um but uh, now that we're talking about seating i think charlie you were wanted to mention something right yeah I, I think that it definitely should lean towards comfort and the seating should be structured so that it complements the ability of the park again to be flexible have some tents set up and for events and so when people are there for events whatever the wherever the permanent seating is they can feel comfortable in sitting in it for the event mm -hmm. So I, I guess that, that'll go into kind of my next thought though, is you know talking about putting some seating on uh, concrete walls or, or some sort of retaining walls. Um, I think we'll I imagine we would want some, some more traditional benches in there. Um, do you think there's a desire for uh, like some of the picnic table style, uh, game table style that Kayla's, Kayla showed earlier? I think the game table style for sure. Um, picnic tables take up a lot of space, don't they? So, um, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe one, but I don't know if you've got enough space for for uh, more than one picnic table. But I think the game tables, because they're relatively small, mm -hmm. um, the game tables are, uh, last a long time. They're concrete, uh, very low maintenance. So those make make a lot of sense to me, and you can use them for other things. I mean, you can sip your coffee there or whatever, or have a sandwich at the game table. They're flexible. Yeah, yeah. There's... We didn't really cover this in the presentation too, but um, I know that I think Michelle mentioned having movie night, or maybe it was Brandy mentioned having movie, I think it was Brandy mentioned having movie nights. Um, is a performance space or sort of a, 
like a platform space, something that would be desired here? Because that could be something that we could we could plan for and and it kind of plays to that flexible use, but also gives you the infrastructure you would need to host those sort of events, um, I guess, more so, easily. Hey, well, I would say no. <laughs> no? <laughs> I, just my own opinion. I would say no, just because there's a larger one down the street. Like that has a okay. beautiful view of the city. Mm -hmm. um, so if if we're if we're looking at the space itself and you know putting up stone and concrete, like you want it to be a comfortable park. Uh, you know what I'm hearing from Titus is a park where people can come, put up their tents. If you start putting all of the, you know the performance area, then you take away from that. Uh, and then so more more like something more like a platform than something like a stage, I guess was. So the condo association, the condo association has built a platform <laughs> out there that they use for various things. Um, in the summer, I think it's Monday nights, the musicians on Beach Gun Street um, give a concert. Is it Sunday, Monday or Sunday, Jose? But they give a concert once a week and they, they just set up out in front of their house. Nice. Um, and people go and sit on the wall by the, where the, that surrounds the fort across from Beach Plain. And, and other people bring their chairs and they sit there and they listen to these guys that do their free concert uh, in the summer, once a week. Isn't there uh, somebody in the uh, orchestra that lives in that neighborhood as well? I thought I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm sure that concert is <laughs> a stunning a concert yeah. to have in the community, <laughs> right? Yeah, go ahead, Jose. Basis. We have quite a few performance spaces in the community. There's a large one up the hill where Berkeley has the summer concerts. Right. Uh, Nicholas puts his stuff out. And uh, I've never really seen them used. I know that there's one over there at Jackson Square that's never been used. There's also one over there at the other Titus, uh, the other park over there near, um, near, uh, near the O'Brien School. I've never seen anybody use them, so. Jim Jones Park, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen anybody use these performances because it takes grants to have musicians and performers come in. And it all depends on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the environmental, the cultural environment at that time. I've never, I've been here for 50 years. I've never seen it used since summer thing back in the 1970s. Okay. Yeah, and just given our given our size on here, I think it would be very much, you know, yeah. a musician a from the community. Yeah, mm -hmm. that at most. Okay. So one of the things Kayla uh, um, mentioned a little bit is the idea of some stairs in the park, um, and and looking at some of the access to the site. Typically, we try and have two access points to any, any of our parks, just from a safety standpoint. Um, obviously, from an ADA uh, accessible standpoint with this park and being on a very, very steep street, um, you know, we're going to look at the park internally being ADA accessible, meaning it can nav uh, any users can navigate uh, with any mobility uh, devices. However, again, looking at the sidewalk and knowing how steep it is, um, in thinking about trying to include two entrances. There's the possibility at the lower end of the street, um, some sort of stair entry, whereas where the current entrance is a flush condition that meets the street. So I'm just curious what you guys would uh, be interested in seeing for kind of the periphery, periphery of the park, how that looks from uh, uh, constituents coming from the street. You know, are, are some, I know she showed some examples of archway entrances or, or more elaborate fencing um, or stairs. I'm just wondering what any input would be on that. And to kind of piggyback on that question too, the, the vegetation that's along the street right now, um, is there a desire to keep the park kind of private? Like you go in and it's sort of this, I mean, I know it's very open right now, but it's kind of this little oasis, or would it be more preferred to have kind of more open sight lines from the street and maybe take out those like large overgrown shrubs, but maybe just leave the trees to give a little presence there? I think that uh, more sight lines from the street, which also implies more safety, um, would be my desire. I think that uh, the fencing. I like the archway. I mean, 
you know, my hope is that um, there's a wow factor. You know, just, and, it, and it's, it's a, a reoccurring wow factor. So the people who live here don't get tired of looking at it. Mm-hmm. And, and it's pleasant. And people who come to visit who don't live here, they look at that, wow, look at that park. That's really nice. So, you know, that's the, that's the effect that I'm hoping we get out of this. And I think you can do that. Um, this, is, this, is, this is my days on the park commission. I, I am conscious of cost. <laughs> but I think that you can do that um, with some really good fencing, a nice archway, and, you know, minimize the interior so that uh, you, you are, sorry, so that you are, um, have a low maintenance park that people can enjoy, that's attractive, and still sort of carries that theme of wow right into the park. And I would agree with Charlie. I would like that too. Very, it's open now. We overlook it. I mean, we love looking at the dog so that we don't need it. I'm again, just speaking for myself, but I wouldn't want to see it blocked off. And like you said, the wow factor and, and, and safety too. Just we want to open, everyone can ex- and access it and uh, you know, use it for, for good purposes. Um, just thinking back to the presentation, I guess the next thing would be is that, um, you know, Kayla talked about, you know, the sun angles and things like that, but also talked about um, any type of shade structure element, you know, that, that could be, uh, you know, a, a subtle small one that kind of is like the gazebo type one that could be more of a pergola, a little bit more transparent. Um, a lot of times we try and have um, the structures be a little bit more transparent, so it does provide shade, but it also doesn't become um, desirable for actually shelter, you know, uh, for, for any of that use. So what do you guys think about any sort of feature like that within the park? And to add to that, an alternative for sometimes when people prefer, they want shade, but they don't necessarily want a structure, um, shade trees are always a great alternative. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm dominating, but shade trees, shade trees are great. Um, my, one concern I, I have about trees is that we need to put, again, I'm, I'm concerned about maintenance. If we put trees in there that uh, are very leafy, shed heavy in the fall, and um, you know, you get leaves all over the place and no one to really clean them, that's a problem. So that's the one concern I would have. But I, I think that the other thing is that spot, my, this side of uh, Fort Ave and over there gets a lot of direct sunlight in the summer. It, it almost beats down. And so if we're going to get some daytime use out of it, it would be helpful to have some shady spots mm-hmm. if that's doable. Yeah. When we met you out there, it was a very warm day. I remember yeah. it being really hot. <laughs> So, that, so, and again, I'm going through my mental uh, memory of the presentation, I guess. So the other elements talking about any sort of pathway mm-hmm. or, or walkway we do through the park, uh, thinking about what sort of surfacing that is. I know uh, we've mentioned being uh, con- cost conscientious so far. Um, you know, Kayla's team, again, is going to work on several designs that we can see where, where we really are comfortable spending or increasing the budget on certain items. So, you know, is this the type that we would be comfortable with asphalt or concrete pathways going through the park? Is it something that we want, uh, you know, any of the walk that happens within the park to be a little bit more accentuated with some sort of uh, more detailed paving? Any thoughts on that? I think um, I, I like Charlie's idea about the wow factor because my my sister was into the wow factor <laughs> um, and, and just about everything she did in a, in a very good way. So um, whether it's a paving design, something creative, I, I, I think that's a little more interesting than um, asphalt or plain old concrete unless it's pressed concrete. Uh-huh. So I, I like that idea. And I, I just wanted to get back to the trees. Um, um, I think trees and shrubs and 
plants, anything like that is a sign of life and living and growth and um, hope. And um, to me, a park is live, um, thriving vegetation. And uh, I, I think that would be a, a, a critical uh, element of what you come up with for a design. Definitely. Well said. Yeah, I would uh, say, uh, I don't know if you saw some of the first slides with the passive park, but that one really caught my eye. It was just green, 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 just sitting and tranquil, serene, bring your book there. And that's, I don't know if that's your vision, Charlie, but. Um, Absolutely. Really yeah. I, I would say stay away from asphalt, please. <laughs> I mean, Brick pathways and, and that kind of thing makes sense to me, but asphalt. Mm. There we go. Great. And Jose, go ahead. Uh, I agree. I think asphalt and concrete are inappropriate because it's so small uh, that we could use uh, natural, natural permeable pavers or um, granite cobblestones or even Roxbury pudding stone uh, pathways. I think the pathway, if you, I think it should be a simple, a simple pathway with a small shade grove, tree grove with evergreens and maybe an elm tree, uh, because they, uh, Charlie, they, they don't, the leaves right. are not, they're not that bad. And then I'm on, uh, I'm at Margaret, right? When we create the friends of the of the park, uh, I'll I'll clean up the leaves myself. <laughs> so I think we should have a small grove for the shade. Um, uh, and a meandering path that's as natural as possible. We don't need any asphalt or concrete. If we could, if we, if we need, if we do um, some signage or uh, a little story about Paula, you know, granite, you know, carved in granite would be really nice. And if we use the old cobblestone pathways with spacing between them so the water can go through, it'd be a nice, uh, nice, uh, a nice approach. Okay, so good, good input. The one thing to keep in mind with with any surfacing we do, uh, you know, we need to make sure it, it meets ADA compliance. So there are some sort of some regulations that dictate what materials we can do. But again, we can certainly explore and make sure we're we're using some rich materials to to make it definitely a wow factor. Um, sometimes even if you do sort of the body in a in like a compliant material and then have a border, that's something that's more decorative. That can be a way to incorporate those materials and um, A, meet those compliance standards, but also um, help meet the budget as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, based on some of those, those input, uh, statements and, and definitely to go back to Debbie's comment about um, you know, thriving vegetation, um, I think if we are to look at any play equipment, does it, it sounds like having that be something that's a little bit more subtle and softer and more natural colors would, would be something that would be desired. Obviously, if you have this thriving natural park, you don't want this jarring, you know, bright blue or, or green. Yeah. Or, Primary colors. Yeah. Enemy of <laughs> yeah. So does that, is that sound on board with, with what people are thinking and, and kind of the vision that we're working on? I see Michelle, you're nodding. So, and I see Jose's thumbs up. I know Debbie's you don't like smiling, so <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. So I'm just uh, being conscious of time. We're we're set for 7:30, um, so we just have a few more minutes. Um, so is there anything else? Uh, I, uh, I see a hand raised here. Um, I, if you can, I think you can unmute you can yourself. yourself yeah, in the lower corner. There you go. Perfect. Is that working on your end? Now? Yep. Yes, there you go. Okay, my headphones was in. Oh, I can barely hear you. Uh, sorry about that. So my question is, um, what's the plans to raise money for the construction? It's a good question. Um, so right now, um, you know, we're, we're still looking at what exactly the community wants. Um, so once we can kind of flush that out, we'll have a better idea of what that will cost. I can tell you that, um, you know, we did put a placeholder in the, uh, parks department capital budget request that hopefully, uh, that will be voted on, you know, once that goes through the process, those are voted, 
uh, in early summer and then go into effect, you know, July, July 1 with the fiscal year. Um, you know, that's, that, that's voted on by city council. So that's, that's the process that goes through. Again, we put it in the request, hopefully that gets approved, but oftentimes, uh, especially with kind of the kind of precarious year we've had here, um, there's no guarantees on, on that actually getting funded. There are um, definitely other grant funding app, uh, sources that we can look at. The design portion was is funded through CPA, uh, the Community Preservation Act. So that's certainly something, um, you know, when we get a better idea of what the capital budget is, that if, if there's any shortcomings or anything in that, we can look at that as well. Um, I think Charlie, you might know uh, some, some input that you wanna talk to as well. Well, I, I think that um, like all of these projects, um, there's some politics involved, um, but hopefully with the work that Nate's done, and, and I gotta say, Nate, I think from my experience, you've done a really good job of sort of positioning the park in terms of where it should be for funding. And I'm hoping that that, that will make things go a lot smoother, but you know, it's, it's the city of Boston. And so you have to, <laughs> you sort of have to play the, play the game the way it gets played here to be successful. I'll be involved to some extent, um, and I'm optimistic. Um, and again, part of my optimism, optimism comes from um, the, way, the way Nate has his, his park position. So I think we're in good shape. Great. Okay, thank you for answering. No problem. Okay, so with that, um, I'm, it's, it's, we have one minute left. What I'm gonna ask is uh, Kayla to put back up the, the final slide of the presentation. That has, um, uh, it, it, once it's coming up right now. So um, based on feedback tonight, um, I'm gonna give Kayla's team to kind of digest that and see when they feel comfortable on scheduling a next meeting. Um, obviously, again, they're gonna be coming up with the design concepts. So, uh, you know, that's gonna take some time. So we have your contact meeting from uh, um, signing up tonight. Again, I'm, I'm going to, um, uh, in the chat feature was my email, which is nathan.frazy at boston.gov. So definitely share that with anybody that couldn't come tonight. Um, you can also, here we go, it's going to be typed in there, uh, real-time uh, service right there. Um, but then there is the project webpage there as well. I know uh, Christine put that in, in the chat feature there as well. Um, so boston.gov backslash Paula dash site. Yeah, that's for the website. Um, so one, one thing on this slide is any immediate issues uh, associated with the park. Um, you certainly can reach out to Christine or myself, but also 311 is a great resource, uh, not only for the park, but the, the neighborhood as a, as a whole. Um, so if anybody didn't speak tonight, but there was input you wanted to get, feel free to email me um, and I'll make sure that gets uh, included in the meeting minutes as well. So with that being said, unless there is, and I'm just gonna zoom up so I can see the full attendees. Um, unless there is any, any additional or last minute comments, I'm gonna close the meeting. Oh, Nate, I just have one quick question. Perfect, go ahead. Uh how long would uh, this Kayla's process usually take? So if I get together with the, commu uh, the community here, um, is it like within the next month? I just need to, would like to know the timing. So typically we, we schedule our meetings for about a month or a month and a half apart. Um, mm -hmm. That gives them some time to, to get, get some designs processed. Um, so if you're able and Kayla can definitely speak to this since she's doing the work. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, if you ideally could get, um, you know, some input from them within the next week or two, uh, I think that would be sufficient. But Kayla, go ahead. Yeah, that would be great. Um, we'll probably kind of really start digging into design based on the feedback we've received tonight, um, starting this week. But we're Again, like Nate was saying, we're going to sort of develop a few different concepts. So I think that um, regardless of the feedback, we'll kind of use that to help mold um, elements of some of those ideas so that they're, that um, is incorporated. Because I'm sure that you'll get sort of conflicting feedback too. You know, some <laughs> people are going to want dog parks, some people won't want this or that or the other thing. So um, okay. 
I, I think typically we we can't include everything all in one park, but we try to provide options that people can choose from. Okay, that's great. And again, and again, when her team comes back, the important thing to know is not, it's not one or the other for any of the designs. You know, we wanna hear what you like about each of them. So it may only be certain portions of each and then they can work on, you know, compiling that. Is that compatible with, you know, design A or, you know, concept B, whatever. So, um, you know, that's gonna still be uh, more a collaborative process even during that design approach. Great, thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, uh, wish you all well and uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. See you next time. <laughs>